and about a lot of the things that people are scared of and movies. And today we're going to talk about ghosts and a ghost story. And uh, you know, the question comes out: Do you believe in ghosts? And an unbelievable amount of Christians do <coughs> believe in ghosts, which is really shocking because Jesus says. He is the only a resurrection. And uh, <clears throat> I have a lot of faith in the Son of God. And I could just see Jesus on my time of death saying, Dan, I'm going to take your spirit out of your body. And before heaven, just a little bit, I want you to walk the halls of this library for 150 years. Will you do that for me? Everybody believes that Jesus would do that. Oh, yeah? You know? Hey, Dan, this is what I want you to do. I want you to pretend you're a hitchhiker on this road. And I want you to pull people over and get in the car. And I want you to say, boo, and disappear out of their cars and making them wreck. Because Jesus is the resurrection. And you know, Jesus is just that kind of guy, isn't he? But a lot of Christians believe in it. I, for one, am terribly disappointed because have any of you ever watched, I, I know I'm weird, but I watch some of the stupid movies on the sci-fi channel because if you've missed any of the Sharknado movies, you've really missed out. And uh, they, every once in a while, those things, they'll have a contest that if you go stay in this haunted house and make it for a whole night, they'll pay you a million dollars. And they never accept my application. Because I'll be honest, one of the rules is you can't take your cell phone in. I would get a good night's sleep. I wouldn't get a text at 1.30 in the morning saying, Dad, we're home, which I'm grateful for those texts. But sometimes I don't always go right back to sleep. And so anyway, I, I, I just don't believe in ghosts. And, 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 and that, I don't believe in zombies. I, I'm not scared to be in a graveyard at night. It doesn't bother me. And, uh, but I, I do wonder why people are so into ghosts. And I think that one of the things that we have to come up with is, what would you say to a ghost? If you had a chance to meet a ghost, what would you say? Because you have all these questions. Right? That's why you want me, because you know sometimes, and it's true that people will even go in and pay for what's called a seance. And everybody sits around a table and hold hands, and there's a ball in the middle, and, they, and, they, and, they, and somebody tells you that they can contact the dead. And some of these people have got really famous. One guy had a TV show, I can't remember his name, but they'll tell you what the dead have to say. And, and you know, my thing is, is that most of the people who want to talk to the dead can't talk to Jesus. Did you know that? They don't have a prayer life. You see, if I want to know a question about the past, I ask Jesus. I'm not stupid. If I thought there was a family treasure, which in my family, there's not a family treasure. I'm the family treasure. Uh, there's not a family treasure. But if I wanted to know where the family treasure was buried, do you know who I would ask? I would ask Jesus. Because he knows everything, doesn't he? And you know, Jesus tells us to come to him and ask things. But a lot of people don't trust that. A lot of people want to go back and they want to talk to people and, and want to talk to and, and, and it's perfect fodder for demons. Because if you're already believing in that, you don't believe that Jesus is the resurrection. And if you talk to a demon who's at the end of the bed dressed like Grandpa Willie, then you know what? It takes you farther from your belief in Jesus. And I think some people see things that they think are ghosts. And I think that they see demons. And I know that these people do not believe that Jesus is the resurrection. And so when the devil supplies a demon to show them something, it takes them farther from their belief in Jesus. And so I think that some people see things. 
But that's the story we're going to talk about today because when you are in debates with people about ghosts, one of the things they always talk about is there's a ghost in the Old Testament. Did you know that? And the ghost was Samuel. And it is from 1 Samuel 28. And we are going to discuss that today. And it further will let us know that Jesus is the resurrection. And we will see the problems in the story. We will see the holes in, in how people who debate and say that there are such things as ghosts how they don't understand the Word of God. And before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, I'm so thankful that you are God and you are eternal life. And Lord Jesus, you won the victory over death and we will all live forever. And we praise you for that. And Lord, I just ask that you will help us to understand that these Halloween ghost things are fun, but we don't need to be scared of things that go bump in the night. Lord, we just need to trust in you and know that you are always there for us. And understand and let your Holy Spirit fill us so that we're even closer to you. And we have that relationship with you that doesn't make us worry about these silly things. But helps us to stay focused on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, uh, people think they'll find their answers from the dead. And that's what most of these seances are. They're where people want to go and ask questions to find answers to things that they need to know. And, and that comes down to the first thing, you have to have a belief. Do you think that the dead talk? Do you think that they are out there trying to communicate? Because I tell you something, it has made billions and billions of dollars for the movie industry. Oh yeah? People were in their seats and you know, there's, there's one set of movies, I don't know if you've ever seen them, called Paranormal Activity. Have you ever heard of it? And, and parallel normal activity is totally set up and is all done by video cameras, the old video cameras. And, and they sit them around and supposedly, you know, you see a pencil move 12 inches in the middle of the night. And that's proof that your house is tilting downhill. And, uh, and these people go and, you know, they, they pay all this money to watch this stuff and they see that. And then they, they, they believe that they can talk to the dead, and so then they go to a seance, and they, they pay this person a big ton of money to contact their dead friend or relative or Abraham Lincoln or somebody. And if you didn't get there, what would you ask? Because I told you before that demons, I think, are huge in this, and that they really misguide people. And, and people come in and do this, and it takes you. So, would you trust the answers? Because what would you ask them, and then you get an answer, would you trust the demon? Because what if it's demons? You're in big trouble. Because they're going to give you the stuff that Satan wants you to know. Not the truth. Because we know that Jesus is the truth. The Old Testament really told us in no terms, in Leviticus, it's the death penalty for trying to talk to the dead. Pretty just flat out, isn't it? That's how God felt about it. And any of you will say, well, why did you do that? There must be great answers from the dead. No, there's no great answers from the dead. There's no answers from the dead. It's one of those relationship things. Since the beginning, God has been trying to get his people to talk to him. People, I had a guy ask me the other day, he said, Dan, how many times do you think you pray a day? I don't even know. It might be 26 or 27 times a day. I, I, I'll go to a hospital room and I'll be in there when the doctor gives them some horrible news. And you know what the first thing I start doing? I start praying. I don't pray out loud because they might not like it. But I start praying right there because you know what? That doctor can't help this man or woman. They're going to try. The only one that can help is the great physician, God, the person who created the body. Jesus Christ can take care of it. The person to ask is God. Oh, yeah? And the person to ask for all of our answers is God. And if we spent more time in prayer, we would develop a larger confidence in that. We would develop more strength in our dependency on God. 
But you know what? I was closer to Uncle Jimmy than I am God. So I'd rather get the answer from Uncle Jimmy. And that's the way people feel. You know that? I would rather hear it from Uncle Jimmy than God. Because I'm just, you know, Jimmy and I, we were always buds. And you see, Saul was there. Saul, as we study Saul, an amazing thing. God took this young man from nothing and made him king of Israel and gave him incredible victories and did incredible things for him. And Saul never understood God. The more things started happening, the more things that Saul started believing was him. That, hey, I'm awesome. I'm fantastic. Everything I touch turns to gold. Everything I do is victory. I, I, I'm not even sure there's a God. You ever heard that before? You ever seen people with that attitude? And that they start taking off like that? And that is basically Saul. And then all of a sudden, Saul gets into a place where a lot of people get. My dad always called it, the wheels fall off. He would say, you ever been to a golf tournament? You're shooting par, under par. And all of a sudden, they make about three double bogeys in a row. That's called the wheels falling off. And I remember that greatly. And Saul, all of a sudden the wheels fell. 1 Samuel 28, 1-7. Samuel had died sometime earlier. And Samuel and Saul were friends, even though it was kind of a dad-son relationship. Saul had, Samuel had no problem disciplining Saul. And Samuel had died sometime earlier. And people from all over Israel had attended his funeral in his hometown of Ramah. Meanwhile, Saul had been trying to get rid of everyone who spoke with the spirits of the dead. Because... It's really thought that Paul is, that Saul is trying to please Samuel more than he pleased God. And Saul had been trying to get rid of everyone who spoke with the spirits of the dead. But one day the Philistines brought their soldiers together to attack Israel. Achish told David, of course you know that you and your men must fight as part of our Philistine army. David answered, that will give you a chance to see for yourself just how well we can fight. In that case, Achish said, you and your men will always be my bodyguards. The Philistines went to Shunem and set up camp. Saul called for the army of Israel together. And they set up their camp in Gilboa. Saul took one week to look at the Philistine army and started shaking with fear. So he asked the Lord what to do. But the Lord would not answer, either in a dream or by priest or prophet. Then Saul told his officers, find me a woman who can talk to the spirits of the dead. I'll go to her to find out what's going to happen. His servants told him, there's a woman at Endor who can talk to the spirits of the dead. So as we look at this story, the first thing we see is that Saul is trying to get rid of all the people who talk to the dead. But you know, and the reason that he did this is because it's against God to try to the dead. And he also was embarrassed for his kingdom because he knew all the people were fakes. Okay? Saul was smart enough to understand that all these people who said they talked to the dead were fakes. All right. Now, do you believe that people who talk to dead are fakes? And that's where you are. Except for Saul, things got really bad. So all of a sudden, he's not sure what to do. And he's praying. And it's not going well because he has no relationship with God. So he got real nervous about the situation. So Saul calls for someone who can talk to the dead. Because he has no trust in God. And people will say, can he call on God? And, and I want to tell you what he's doing here. Have you ever heard of somebody who doesn't really believe in God? So they'll buy a prayer book and they'll kind of read it out loud just to see if anything happens. You know? That's pretty much where Saul was. Because see, when we talk to God, when you talk to God, do you just think you're flinging some words out there or are you talking to somebody? Are you talking to somebody who you have 100% confidence is listening and going to do what you ask? Because that's a relationship with God. That is a relationship that, that, that's what drives you to pray. That's what drives you to talk to Him. You want to be in His presence. You want to talk to Him with your words. You want to hear His words. You have a relationship, and in your life, you're obedient. And as I talk to you today, I'm not talking about perfect obedience because 
The Bible tells us we're all going to fall short, right? We're going to screw up. But we are trying to be obedient. We are working at being obedient. We're studying His Word. We're looking at it. We're trying to do our very best to see what He calls us to be. It's tough to be 100% perfect, isn't it? I, I, I watch sick people now, and I watch some wonderful, wonderful Christians who get very selfish in the face of pain. Have you ever seen that before? Somebody who's an incredible Christian, and when the pain gets great, all of a sudden they become very selfish. The things are about them. And it's tough. I had an Uncle Vernon who I loved beyond belief. No matter what they did to Uncle Vernon, all he did was think about everybody else. I went in one day and they cut off half his foot. And I said, Uncle Vernon, I said, how you feeling? I'm doing great, Danny. How are things for you? You know, and I'm like, Lord, let me be like that. Let me be that way. Because when we think about being imperfect, we, we think of a major thing, you know, like, well, I didn't go steal any cars yesterday. <laughs> but maybe it's being mean to people. Maybe it's not loving on people. Maybe it's let that little bit of racism crawl up in us. And having a bad thought like that. And those are things that distance us from God. And, and when we're staying close to God and trusting in God, talking to God is a different thing. We don't need to worry about talking to the dead. We can trust in God. But Saul had no trust in God. God doesn't want us to try to contact the dead. And like I said, it's not because he's mean or he doesn't want us to have fun. It's because, I, I have to laugh, one of my favorite rides at uh, Disney World is the Haunted Mansion. And if you've never been on it, you go around this curve and there's this witch and she's, her head's in a crystal ball and she says these poems and it's like, if the dead are out there doing something, make this bell ring, and this bell rings up in the air, and you go around, and, then, and you know, I always picture that. And that's fun to watch that, to ride on that ride. It makes you laugh. Because it makes you laugh because it's so stupid. But see, Saul is ready for his seance because he doesn't trust God. And in 8 through 11, it says that night, Saul put on different clothing so nobody would recognize him. And he and two of his men went to the woman and asked, will you bring up the ghost of someone for us? The woman said, why are you trying to trick me and get me killed? You know King Saul has gotten rid of everyone who talks to the spirits of the dead. Saul replied, I swear by the living Lord that nothing will happen to you because of this. Who do you want me to bring up, she asked. Bring up the ghost of Samuel, he answered. Saul is ready to break God's law, break his law, because he's in such a desperate thing. He has announced that anybody will be punished. God has announced that anybody will be punished. Sam Saul's in such panic that he asked this lady who is kind of historically known as the witch of Endor to bring back Samuel. And, and it's against everything. But he's in desperate times and he has no faith. He doesn't trust God. He doesn't pray anymore. He didn't have patience. He didn't like that God wouldn't answer his prayers because there's a reliance that we go to. You know, David, when David found out how he had sinned with Bathsheba, he went into a time of fasting and a time of deep prayer and allowed for the time for his fact when the baby would die. He, he, he allowed that time to pass when the baby would die because he knew that was the discipline from God. And he didn't know how far the discipline would go. There were even times in David's life where he had to do one of the most horrible things that I could never imagine doing. He had to pick discipline. God said, you've really screwed up. I'm going to give you two or three options of things I'm going to do to punish you for what you've done. And David picked the best punishment that he thought was best for everybody because of what he had done. And so Saul, being far away from God, he doesn't have that kind of humbleness. He doesn't have that thing where he can come and let God take care of things. He wants to immediately 
hear from Samuel. And I hope we see the problem in this. Because the thing is, we need to find our answers in God. In 1 Samuel 28, 12 through 14, when the woman saw Samuel, she screamed. Then she turned to Saul and said, you've tricked me, you're the king. Don't be afraid, Saul replied, just tell me what you see. She answered, I see a spirit rising up out of the ground. What does it look like? It looks like an old man wearing a robe. Saul knew it was Samuel, so he bowed down low. Now, and, and when we read this in the original Hebrew, and we see it, you can see this even is transferred into English. This lady is really scared because for 50 years, she's been faking people out. And all of a sudden now she calls and somebody's really there. I think that's hilarious. God is so funny. When you read the Bible, you find out that God has the greatest sense of humor. He is just absolutely hilarious. This woman has been faking forever, and he sends her Samuel. And it's, it's just fantastic. To, I, I, I would love to be able to see the whole thing happen. She had never seen a ghost, but it's not a ghost. And this is where you win the debate. This is where you find out your faith. Because see, this is not only the only time that God ever let that happen. Oh yeah? Because we go to the book of Matthew. But how many of you are familiar with the transfiguration? Now I want you to know, Moses died before he got into the promised land. Okay? Then Elijah was one of two people who was allowed to go to heaven without dying. And all of a sudden we read Matthew 17, 2 and 3. There in front of the disciples, Jesus was completely changed. His face shining like the sun and his clothes become white as light. And all at once, Moses and Elijah were there talking with Jesus. These were not ghosts. Elijah was sent from heaven. Moses was sent from the rest of the righteous to come and be with Jesus to talk to him about how things were going to be at the crucifixion. I love Max Licato always says when he talks about this, he says that Moses says, Jesus, hurry up and die on the cross and raise from the dead. I want to see the promised land. I love that. That's fantastic. But what happens is you have to see the difference between ghosts and the new bodies that are given us by God. And the bodies in the spiritual form. It's a, it's a different form. You have to remember there was no pictures. None of those disciples knew what Moses and Elijah looked like. Oh yeah? But as soon as they seen them, they knew that it was Moses and Elijah. Which tells you something about our new body. And as soon as Sam saw her, he knew it was Samuel. Samuel was like Moses and Elijah, which takes care of the whole ghost debate. The whole thing about, you know, if somebody's out there floating in the air, or somebody's there, you know, the body tells us that to be, or the Bible is here the body. So the Bible tells us that to be absent from the body is to be with Jesus. To be absent from the body is to be with Jesus. There's no floating. There's no hanging out somewhere. There's no... And, and people say, well, what about people who aren't going to go be with Jesus? They're in a place called the rest of the wicked. And they're waiting in torment for their judgment when they'll be in hell. How do I know this? How do I know this for a fact? I know this for a fact because it all comes from God's Word. Oh, yeah? I don't have to struggle and talk to scientists. I don't have to worry about reading what books say. And like I said, can you read some guy that will tell me that he has met ghosts and talked to people and seen ghosts? Absolutely. And I believe that he has said and had conversations with demons. Because the longer people believe in ghosts, the less they believe in Jesus. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy not to let anything give us a spirit of timidity. <laughs> you know what? One of the priests that worked for King James was actually Dr. Seuss. 
Uh, he said, I'm going to make these people say divinity for a thousand years. So let's translate it today. It says, the Bible says, let nothing give you a spirit of fear. Why would you have a spirit of fear when you live with God? When Jesus lives inside of you, the God is with you in every step that you take. Why would you have a spirit of fear? When you know what your eternity is and that you're going to be with Jesus, why would you live with a spirit of fear? Okay, there are certain things that you'll be afraid of. I told some people at the hospital, they said that there's haunted houses in Florida scary. I said, no. I said, if you want to get scared, go to the oncologist or the IRS. That's scary. Ghosts aren't scary. Because they're not real. They're not real. First Samuel 28, 15 through 25. Why are you bothering me by bringing me up like this, Samuel asked? I'm terribly worried, Saul answered. The Philistines are about to attack me. God has turned his back on me and won't answer anymore by prophets or by dreams. What should I do? Samuel said, if the Lord has turned away from you and is now your enemy, don't ask me what to do. I've already told you. The Lord has sworn to take the kingdom from you and give it to David, and that's what he's doing. When the Lord was angry with the Amalekites, he told you to destroy them, but you didn't do it. That's why the Lord is doing this to you. Tomorrow the Lord will let the Philistines defeat Israel's army. And when you and your sons join me down here in the world of the dead, at once Saul collapsed and they stretched out on the floor, terrified at what Samuel had said. He was weak because he had not eaten anything since the day before. The woman came over to Saul and when she saw that he was completely terrified, she said, Your Majesty, I listened to you and risked my life to do what you asked. Now please listen to me. Let me get you a little something to eat and we'll give you strength for your walk back to camp. No, I won't eat. But his officers and the woman kept on urging Saul until he finally agreed. He got up off the floor and sat on the bed. Right away the woman killed a calf that she had been fattening up. She cooked part of the meat and baked some of the thin bread. Then she served the food to Saul and his officers who ate and left before daylight. Saul did not like the answers he got from Samuel. It was amazing because it was the same answers that God had been giving him. And he wouldn't trust God giving. You know, the other thing is, is that uh, I would hope that if anybody would get the word that God was upset about something, that the first thing they would do is repent. That they would start saying they're sorry. You would know, read a lot about in the Old Testament about where guys ripped their clothes and sat in ashes and all those things to tell God they were sorry. You notice that Saul doesn't do this, does he? He stays very proud. He stays who he is because he never had a relationship with God. The next day, Saul and his sons all died. This was a tragic day for Israel, even a tragic day for David. But we have to ask ourselves, do we trust God? Do we trust God? Can we seek our answers in God instead of the dead? Can we forget all this nut stuff that we've been raised with? They were raised with it back then too. You remember when Jesus came walking across the water, the first thing that the disciples said was, it's a ghost. Jesus went along with them and what they'd always heard about in their campfire ghost stories when he rose from the dead. He said, you can see I'm not a ghost because I'm sitting here eating fish sticks with you. And they all knew the ghosts to eat in their own stories because their campfire stories were fun. They had fun telling those camp stories. I think that story about the guy with the hook, they were probably telling us that story about 4,000 years ago. Because these things are fun. This little jump scares can be fun, but when it becomes real to us, we're in trouble. When you find yourself four nights a week watching those shows about the ghosts in the prison, or the ghosts in the mental institutions, or the, you know, and, and they're saying, listen, and you hear that static, <laughs> and they say, you can pick out of there and say, Jim, can I have some pancakes? You ever watch that? Oh, you gotta watch it at least once so you can have a good life. But people would rather believe in that than God. 
People would rather believe in that than the true one who defeated death, who died on the cross and three days later rose from the dead. He told us, I am the resurrection. I am the truth, the life, and the way, and there's no way the Father except through me. That's the truth. And we have to learn to trust and obey. And if you do not, if you've not followed him, if you've not learned